local regulations, and I'll talk about this later as well, on radiation protection and other things. The local regulations. I have found over the years that many governments actually have put their local regulations and laws online, which is really nice because if you buy a paper version of regulations, they go out of date quite quickly. So I put some link in here for my home state of California. They have the radiation protection standards and the medical use of byproduct material, which includes brachytherapy. And you can see here, there is a link to it and you see the up-to-date regulations in uh, great detail. I also found, I was looking for English uh, speaking countries in other continents, I found this beautiful review article on laws and regulations in South Africa that outline in, in all detail where you would find these, this information for this specific country. I'm also aware, aware that some of you might live in countries that ha don't have uh, very deeply developed regulations yet. And in those uh, cases, if local resources are underdeveloped, there are IAEA safety standards. I put in the link here for occupational workers that are great guidance. And if you can adhere to those standards, in addition to whatever your local regulation says, then you're, then you're well prepared. I wanted to start with delivery and install. So the device is shipped to you. And a lot of things happen in shipping, believe it or not. I just <laughs> had a new treatment planning system delivered for my afterloader, and this is exactly what happened. <laughs> things arrived damaged because somebody dropped the package. So it does happen. So the first uh, thing you do when you get your afterloader and your treatment planning system delivered, you, you just look. You check the outside of the package. Does it look like it was transported dry, no holes in the package? After you take your afterloader out, and usually you have an install engineer with you, check for visible scratches and dents that could indicate that um, something may have happened and check all the cable connections to see if anything is frayed or looks like it's bent or damaged or sometimes pins of plugs get bent out of shape. I also check the shipping manifesto. Does it agree with the purchase order? And have all items been delivered and accounted for? It's uh, sometimes boxes, if you, if you get multiple boxes for an afterloader, sometimes individual boxes get stored somewhere else and it takes some time to get everything together. The next step is the acceptance testing process. So when does this happen? We just covered the delivery and then the vendor usually comes in and installs the machine. And at that point, the machine is still the property of the vendor or the installer if you have a third party doing it. Anything that breaks at this point for the machine will be fixed by the vendor at no cost to the customer because it's still their property, their ownership. The next step is then you do acceptance testing. And this is usually done by the vendor and the site physicist together. I have done this um, with the vendor not physically being on site, but the service engineer was logged in with me on a conference call like we're doing now for treatment planning system. And we did it remotely. So that works as well. As soon as you sign the acceptance testing document, the machine goes into your ownership. That happens right here. And then you move into commissioning, which means that you get the machine set up and configured to whatever or however you want to use it in your clinic. Let's go a little bit deeper on what acceptance testing actually is because there's all, I often find a little bit confusion about this. So when you, the vendor and you, the customer, have agreed on an afterloader performance standard in a purchase contract. So the, your purchase contract st states you're getting 
a gamma med with a 10 Q resource and the delivery accuracy of the source is plus minus one millimeters. This is all specified in the purchase contract. So the vendor then, when, you, when they deliver the machine, they must demonstrate to you that the afterloader performs to this standard at the time of install. So these standards are listed and tested and documented according to the procedures defined in what we call the acceptance testing document. Once the vendor and the customer both sign the acceptance testing document, the afterloader changes ownership from the vendor to the customer, which means anything you break after you sign that document, you have to pay for it. When you get an acceptance test, testing document, you need to look for the following things. And this is a screenshot of a variant acceptance testing document that I used uh, recently. So it obviously needs to have the vendor logo on it, the product name your acceptance testing. In my case, it was a Brachivision treatment planning system upgrade to version 15.5. You have to have the word acceptance in the document title. So installation product acceptance. And down here, it's a little bit hard to see, is a document version number and the date. And you should check that this is also reasonable and not just not a couple of years back. Typically, it's either this year or the previous year for most situations. So again, I always request acceptance testing document from the vendor in advance of delivering install, not all vendors expect this but if you insist they will actually come around and send that to you so so be be insistent on on getting this then you have enough time to compare the acceptance test specifications to anything outlined in the purchase contract and you can verify that this actually agrees if you find any discrepancies so the acceptance testing document for example misses a functionality that you thought you bought in your equipment Bring this to the vendor's attention as soon as possible, even before delivery, if you possibly can. And if, when you read through this and any of the tests seem unclear to you, don't hesitate to ask the vendor about it. The next step is to determine the time needed for acceptance testing. In my experience, if everything goes perfectly for an afterloader, it's about half a day. One day is more typical because there's always little glitches that you find. After you sign the document, keep the copy of the signed document for your records because it's very important to show that you actually have demonstrated the functionality of the equipment. So this is an example here of, of an acceptance test I did recently. On the left side here, you see that we validated those values at selected reference points. And I crossed out the sources that I didn't have and left this open. I made a note here that I actually verified these numbers and that the brief report is attached from break vision to the site. Here, I checked that the values are within the tolerance and I actually initialed it, this particular test. There are also sometimes these acceptance test documents are written very broadly. There's sometimes tests in there that don't apply to equipment you have in the clinic, for example, here is a VIDAR film scanner test. We do not use that equipment in our clinic. So I made a note here that this is not applicable. In an acceptance testing document, you never leave anything empty. You either make a note that it was done or that it does not apply to your specific clinic. So once you've accepted your machine, you're moving into the commissioning phase. So there's actually four stages. You already covered the radiation protection surveys in topic two. Next, I'll step into IT and system administration. Once that is done, you're going to the functionality of the actual afterloader. And then the next step you would do is setting up the QA. So let's do this first, commissioning. This is stage two of the uh, commissioning process after you've done all the radiation survey. So based on my experience, I always check IT connectivity first. So you're checking that your CT can set or your simulator can check 
then can send images to your planning system that your planning system can send a plan to an afterloader that the planning system connects to your electronic medical record system if you have one and that both the planning system and the afterloader can connect to your printer i often find that at least one of these is not working and i have to get it involved and that takes time for them to sort out. And while IT is um, fixing any connectivity issues, I can actually do the following tests in this lecture in parallel to them. And that saves me time. Another thing I always do is I also figure out how I would do the treatment in case my network is down. So in case of brachytherapy, the good thing is that you always can take the images from your simulator on a USB, walk it over to your treatment planning system, import it there, export the plan from your treatment planning system to USB again, walk it over to your HDR console, and then treat from that plan. I've had my network go down here in the hospital, and it was really, really helpful that this process was tested. And I actually knew how it was working and we could treat the patients. In America, we call this our sneaker net. Be prepared also to test the network down situation. Next, I'm setting up the software on the, treat on the afterloader console. So the first persons you need to get involved here are the system administrators. And their role is to administer the software and that includes making sure that the time and date on your afterloader console is correct. They also do the user administration and they verify and maintain the backup. And I'll go in more detail to, on these two points later. I always have two or three people being system administrators. The reason is that people are out sick, they change jobs or are unavailable on short notice. And you need to have at least one person accessible at all times to have a high level rights into the system. So the usual distribution is that if you have a hospital IT department, I usually make one person from the IT department a system administrator. The lead brachytherapy physicist is a second one. And then I pick one other appropriate person. Sometimes it's another physicist. Sometimes it is a technician who is or a therapist who is very well versed in administering software. User administration is a very important role for the administrator. Usually in most afterloader console softwares, you have predefined user settings. They have the vendors usually define roles for physicians, trainees, physicists, technicians, or therapists. And what you need to do as a system administrator, you need to go into there and uh, see if each of these roles have all rights that are necessary to perform their jobs, how you define them in their clinic. But also check that nobody has more rights than are really necessary to do their jobs. You don't want somebody to go in and be able to change something that they haven't been trained on and mess up the system. So that requires that you have clarity on what each member of your team does in the brachytherapy process. I also highly recommend to regularly review the users. Sometimes roles change, a trainee becomes a fully licensed physician. Sometimes people leave their jobs or new people come in, they need to be ad added. And what I have gotten in the habit of doing is when we do the quarterly source change for the afterloader, I usually take the opportunity and go in and double check my users and see if everything is still up to date. So typical examples of the rights a user has is as a therapist, technician, or doctor, that you can import patient plans, that you can deliver treatments, and that you have all functions, that you can use all functions needed for the daily morning QA checks. The physicist does all of the above, plus is able to edit source parameters for the source calibration and also creating standard plans if you do use them. The administrator has all of these rights and also can administer users and um, work on the backup. So this is 
uh, we we have the physicists administer patients so we allow them to add or delete patients from the system we create standard plans and the physicist also sets up what the dummy run settings are so the dummy runs are when the dummy wire goes out through the transfer tube and checks that the transfer tube is clear and there's no blockage etc and there's usually several options in the software and that varies with the vendor in my particular system i have two options one is that the dummy goes out and checks all the channels at the start of the treatment and then sends the source out to all the channels the second setting is that the dummy goes through all the channels at the start of the treatment and then before it sends the source out it sends the dummy in to the first transfer tube comes back sends the source out then the dummy goes into second transfer tube and sends the source out so this dummy actually goes twice into each transfer tube and different places i've worked at have different preferences at my particular place we check the second option it makes the treatment maybe half a minute longer but we just feel more comfortable to have double dummy runs physicists also will calibrate the source strength uh, we we do that uh, we talk about that in a later lecture they also set the time and frequency of source decay and we'll repeat this information in the treatment planning system so the standard i have seen is that all of that we set the source decay to daily at midnight and this seems to be the standard setting for most vendors on their consoles some vendors may allow different choices but i honestly have never seen a site that has done anything else but daily at midnight on the console the physicist can also make um, the decision of what the source decay settings are for plan delivery and again there are two there are several options and they may differ depending on your vendor the most common options are that both the treatment planning system and the console decay the source daily and if you have that situation you need to verify that the time and frequency of that decay agrees with each other and also verify that the source strength you put in initially agrees option two is that your treatment planning system always assumes a source strength of 10 curie and only after you send your plan to the afterloader console it's decayed to the source strength at time of delivery my personal preference is option two because it takes out the risk of making an error because your treatment planning system always stays the same and cannot ever get out of sync with the console Sandra, can I stop you there for a second? Yeah. Can we go back one slide? Yeah. This so, one? yeah, yeah. So we'll take a, a few minutes and we'll okay. allow everyone to ask us some questions since we're about halfway through. And I thought this was a good time to stop because this is a, a really important slide. Um, so I'd like to just reiterate um, some of what Sandra has said and, and make sure that everyone is really paying attention to this. So this is one of, if we're focusing on an area of great importance for the physicist, this slide has a lot of it. So you want to be really certain um, that you've calibrated your source strength correctly, and that not only have you verified that it agrees with uh, what the manufacturer says the source strength is, but that you've put it in to the planning system with the correct date and time for that source strength. And so yeah. some want you to put in the source strength from the commissioning time, uh, I mean, sorry, the source strength from the calibration certificate. So that would require a, a different source strength than when you measured along with the, the appropriate date. Or you could possibly put it in at the day that you measured it and make sure that that date is right. So again, it's just a very important thing. This whole date and time thing is very important. If you miss it at the beginning, it could be a systematic mess um, for a long time. Yeah. Adam, can you see the uh, brief report that I have on my screen here? No, I can't. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's probably, I can, I can send, I can edit my lecture and put a screenshot in of a treatment plan printout where it shows the nominal activity versus the actual activity. Perfect. Um, Perfect. So, and we can update the slide. Let me just make a note. Okay. Um, Great. 
And, and then I'll also just uh, mention something about the, the second part where it's talking about the source decay from plan to delivery. So again, this is really important. So we'll talk about this more as we get to planning lectures, mm -hmm. some of the other lectures. But again, you need to really understand your system. And so both options are, are valid. Some vendors allow one option. Some vendors allow both options. But you need to be really certain about how your system works and to make sure, again, that these times and dates are proper, depending on how it is. And just a little side note. So with option one, your planning system will have certain uh, times, dwell times. Those will be the exact same dwell times from your plan as they show up on your afterloader. Now, if you're with, with option two, where you always plan with a nominal 10 query source, then you'll have uh, dwell times that are, say, X value. And on your console, it will be a different dwell time, right? Because it's always at 10 queries, but your console is decaying. It's not at 10 queries. So the times will be um, increasing. So that adds in, uh, so they both have their positives and negatives. And you need to think about, again, how can you be best sure that you are delivering what you're delivering? The 10 queries, so you're always certain that your starting starting plan for, say, a tandem and ovoid will be very similar dwell times. So They'll almost always be the exact same. Uh, whereas with option two, they might be different. So again, think about these sorts of things. We'll get to it more in the planning, but I thought this is very important to me. Yeah, true. And I double check this at every source change. I, I make sure that we still have that same setup. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions? You can type them in or I think everyone's muted. So just send a little type if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. we'll carry on right now. Again, if you have okay. questions throughout, just send me a message and we'll be happy to answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Continue on, Sanjay. Thank you. Okay. Back up. This is something I feel very, very, very passionate about. Please back up your hard drive on the console to an external hard drive each night. I've had hard drives go down. It does happen on Windows systems. And it is a really, it's a pain if you don't have a backup. And please also check that the backup is functioning correctly. I've had situations where we thought we backed up, but it actually did not happen. Also, very important, don't just have a, an external hard drive that is sitting right next to the console. Do also a backup to an offsite location. I've had in my clinic broken water pipes that have flooded rooms above the backup disk. We all heard about natural catastrophes. I mean, um, floods, earthquakes here in California, hurricanes in my previous employer. There are lots of situation fires in California. We've had a situation where a clinic burned down and they did not have an offsite backup and all the patient information was lost, everything. So this is why I say it's really, really important that you back up to an offsite location. If you, if you possibly can, even away from your city, different part of the country, Amazon Cloud, whatever is legal in your country while protecting patient information. This remote backup does not necessarily need to be done every night. You can do this weekly or monthly, but I think it is really, really, really important to do that. Um, and I speak from hard earned experience here. It is really difficult if you don't have that because you're starting from scratch. Let's go to afterloader stage three um, commissioning. And this is where you check now that you've set up the software and everything. You now you check that your system is functioning uh, correctly. So this is the overview over the topics that I'll cover in the second half of this talk. So we'll start with the fi uh, system function. The first is all the console functions and you, you're sort of testing that while you're setting up your users play around with all the switches, see that they are doing what they're labeled to do, verify that your backup batteries are working, verify the printer is working, verify that all the indicator lights are working, light bulbs do break, 
So make sure that everything is, is okay. The programmed operation that is kind of integrated in all the next tasks. I do a complete cycle of assimilated treatment actually at the very last here. Then uh, the next step is to verify that your afterloader can uh, position the source accurately. And the last is that it not only positions the source accurately, but also keeps the source in the, pla in the place it's supposed to be for the correct time. So let's look at the checking the safety interlocks first. And I wanted to go, these are actually nicely listed in this document here. Can you see it? Can you see the Excel spreadsheet? No. Ah. Uh, Maybe you can drag it onto that window. I have it in that window. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> try, try one more thing. You can click the share button and share. then click on the actual document instead of a screen. I think yeah. you might be able New to share. Go. This one. Now? Yes, we can see it. Ah, good. Yeah. So this is actually in the NCCR commissioning document that will be shared with you here in the daily check, but it's actually also what you do at um, commissioning. And what I mean here is you, you'll check all these safety checks when you're commissioning. You check that your intercom to the patient is working and the CCTV cameras are working. You verify that your radiation sign is on the door and that your emergency procedures are posted. Then next, all the lights I was talking about. Uh, when the source is out, check that the warning light is actually lighting on, that the secondary alarm check is working even if you remove power to it. So that is checking the battery. You're checking that your survey meters are functional and that the batteries are all loaded and that the radiation lights on the control panel of your uh, consoles are working. Then you're trying your interrupts when something goes wrong during the treatment. All consoles have at least one interrupt button and you should press that during treatment and during a mock treatment and verify that it actually retracts the source. There's also emergency stops outside, usually next to the door um, that you hit is that big red button. And you also should check that this retracts the source. You should also check the door interlock. So when the source is out into your phantom or into your chamber, you open the door and you check that the source is actually uh, retreating. And we'll check these other tests we talk about later. So let's see if I'm going back to my here. So that should get me back to my presentation, right? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. Next, you check the emergency procedures. All afterloaders have an option to manually retract the source. For example, if the motor inside that retracts the source is broken. Um, the service engineer can set up a practice run with you so that you can go in with the afterloader and practice this on a dummy source. So you get actually a manual feel how to do it and you get the tactical feel of when the source is back in the shielded container. This is really important to do because when you have an emergency, you don't have time to figure this out. This is why we usually practice this annually in my centers with all staff, so the physicians, the trainees, the physicists, the nurses, the technicians, therapists, everybody gets to turn that handle so that they know exactly what to do if there's an emergency. So you also check at this point, and I make this part of the afterloader that your emergency equipment is there. So pick and forceps that should be positioned right next to the afterloader with the top open and easy access during a procedure. So we'll cover this more later, but I just wanted to make sure that you also check this at this point in the commissioning process that you figure out where to put this equipment. I also, while we're checking the, all the interlocks and interrupts, I usually check that the emergency instructions are still posted. These procedures are manufacturer specific. This one is for a gamma med. 
I post this at the entrance of the treatment room and most people think it's very funny, but I practice, practice, and practice this again with role play. I actually take the whole breaky team at least once a year, but I'll try quarterly, and we're doing a role play of, okay, let's assume we have an emergency. Let's press the interrupt button on the console. Let's press the e-stop. Let's open the door. Let's figure out who goes where and take who takes care of the patient, who takes care of the source. And we're going through this whole emergency scenario together as a team. And this is very, very important because if you don't do that, you have people running different places and getting in each other's way. And to do this successfully and quickly, you really have to have that practice. Plus, you're checking all the interlocks in your console once again. So let's go to source positioning accuracy. The first thing is you check actually that your source is going to the position you want it to go to. And there are several commercial tools available to do this. And I've put a screenshot up here of one we have, and uh, it's called the Permadoc. <laughs> oh, so what all these tools have are embedded distance markers for reference. And you can see the image is kind of faintly here. These are very thin wires and they are highly accurately machined into this plastic. The tolerance specs the vendors have given me for the placement of these thin wires is plus minus 1.1 millimeters. So it's really next to impossible to build that yourself. So it's very highly accurate machining. And so, what you have then, these wires are embedded on top of the white plastic. Then on top of the white plastic and below the clear plastic, you insert film. We usually use gaff chromic film these days. And then you send the source out to its most distal position here. And then you retract in certain intervals. This one is set up to retract a centimeter at the time. And you make that whole distance as long as your most distal source to however long you will treat in your clinical practice. I use the whole extent of this phantom because sometimes we do sarcoma treatments in uh, big muscles and so we use the whole length and you want to check the source positioning accuracy over the whole length. And the source is doing an autoradiograph and then you want to check, it's usually done visually, if your source agrees with the position of this embedded wire to plus minus one millimeter. So you do that for every channel at commissioning. And in that NCCR1 document uh, I just showed you, I will not switch over because it takes too much time, I think at this point, it's called the transfer tube test. So you do this test at commissioning for every channel you have in your afterloader. So in my gamma med, it's 24 channels. There are also tools available that have multiple channels that you can check simultaneously. They tend to be more expensive, so if you have the money to buy those, this is very nice. It saves you a lot of time. I have to make do with the single channel one. What I also do is at the beginning, I mount a camera above this tool, and a webcam is perfectly accurate. And I sent a dummy source out so I can actually check visually that the dummy source goes to the most distal dwell position. Looking at the literature, this is how most people check the agreement of the dummy source with the actual source wire. And you do that for different, if you have a afterloader system that has different transfer tube length, so for example, a very source, you, you check that with various transfer tube length. If you have a single length system, for example, my gamma met, the, the whole system is always 130 centimeters long. You can just do this once for 130 centimeters and check that the dummy source actually goes all the way to the distal position. I also use this tool to uh, check if there's any, if the system recognizes the channel obstruction by not connecting my transfer tube here properly. I kind of leave it loose 
And then I try to run the test and my system should throw an interlock. And so I have everything in, in one test. So here position accuracy, we talked about with the tool. We verified the source and dummy positional coincidence by putting a camera above the tool and sending a dummy out to the distal. We've checked the cable operation by leaving the connection loose and see that there, there's an interlock error. We've talked about the option of having multiple channel radiographs simultaneously. And I'll skip the test jigs because that is something that is fairly new for systems that we don't have in the clinic quite yet. Last thing I want to cover here is the temporal accuracy. Now that we have the source at the correct position, we want to check that it's actually staying there for the correct time. Typically how we do this is we program a test run and this is a good experience on the console uh, because we're learning at this point how to manually put in a treatment plan into the console and we put it put a defined time in. In my center we usually use two minutes. Uh, then we deliver that treatment and measure the treatment time independently either with a calibrated stopwatch and I honestly nowadays use a phone timer function because they tend to be as accurate um, as a stopwatch. The tolerance for that is plus minus 0.5 seconds of difference. So you should not have, so if you run 120 seconds, you should have no more than 120.5 on your stop, stopwatch and no less than 119.5. Just to put that in here, the typical human reaction time of pressing a button is 0.25 seconds. So you really have to pay attention during this test. So at the end, I can go in the spreadsheet again and show you where these uh, tests are in the spreadsheet. There's also timer, ac oh, here you can see actually here the timer check function uh, stopwatch. And I measured it at 119.33, 4%. It's out of tolerance, so I actually have to repeat this test. Um, yeah. Then the next part is we're checking actually the transit dose and source velocity by checking the timer accuracy. And also we check the linearity at the same time. So what we're doing is we have several plants here that have different dwell times and we're measuring the charge on the electrometer for each of these dwell times. So typically how I often see it set up is have a five second dwell plan, have two consecutive 50 second dwell plans where you don't clear your electrometer. So you get your transfer dose in here. You get a 95 second dwell plan in here and a very long one, a 300 second dwell plan where the transfer time does not uh, uh, play a significant amount in the total charge collected. And with that, you can actually calculate your timer error due to the transfer time, and you can also check your linearity of the plan time versus reader at the same time. And at the very end of the lecture, I'll switch to the Excel spreadsheet and show that to you how it's handled in the spreadsheet. So after we've checked all these other things in the commissioning process, we're going to a complete cycle of a simulated treatment. And it, this is also called an end-to-end -end test. So what you do for your clinic, you create a whole treatment workflow. You specify that your patient gets imaged this way, this is how the images get transferred. This is very small to read, but it just gives you an idea that you should have a list of each step in your treatment procedure. And then you go through this with a phantom. And every step of the workflow should be performed by the staff doing it in the clinic. So that, per, for example, the imaging, the simulation imaging is not done by the physicist, but by the physician who actually will do this when you're doing, using your afterloader in the clinic. That ch does check that the afterloader functions of plan transfer and everything function as intended. And it also checks that the staff is very clear how to use the equipment. 
Because what often happens is that you as a physicist, you commission your afterloader, you're very comfortable with handling this interface, and now your technicians come in who actually deliver the treatment, and they're not as comfortable. And so that helps them, these practice runs help them go over the learning per curve. The way I usually do these end-to-end -end tests in, in practice is I, I use the process for applicator commissioning, and you'll see that in the next lecture. So I basically do two things at the same time. So I have the technologist image the applicator. The physicist creates the treatment plan for the source positions for the autoradiograph that you do. The technician delivers the treatment plan. And if you have it available, you check the dose delivered using TLDs. And that way, you both do this end-to-end -end check of your whole process of the afterloader. And you also, at the same time, your commission, your, your applicators. And again, this will be covered in, in really great detail in lecture five. I've gone over a lot of the mechanical commissioning of the afterloader itself. Once you've done everything that we covered in this lecture, the next step would be doing a full source calibration. And I believe this is covered in lecture six. Then you commission your treatment planning system. That's covered in lectures seven and eight. We've talked about the transfer tubes. This will be probably covered in the same lecture as we're talking about commissioning the applicators. And then I think it's lecture nine and 10. We talk about daily, monthly, and quarterly QA. Adam, is that correct? Uh, I think that's about right, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to put the number in here. So, and part of the checks that you do at commissioning will be repeated daily, monthly, and quarterly. So these are all the other commissioning tasks that will be covered in the future. So I quickly want to say thank you to a few people before I jump back into the spreadsheet. Here's a few resources. Oops, I don't have to thank you slide. Anyway, AAPM TG56, I put the link here, has the code of brachytherapy for brachytherapy physics. And at the end of this document, there, is, there are great, really useful tables with all of these tests. This paper here also has some really good examples on, on tests that you do at commissioning. And I did not call, uh, cover the Bravos afterloader. This is a very new system by Varian in this lecture because it's very different. I'm still learning what they're doing, but there's a very nice paper on how to mechanically evaluate this specific system because it's a little bit different than all the others. So let me jump back to the spreadsheet quickly. And so while Sanja's bringing up this spreadsheet, I'd like to just remind everyone we're covering these nice Excel spreadsheets, checklists, documents in each of our lectures, and we're giving you these spreadsheets for your own use at your clinics. And so if you haven't already received an email with this spreadsheet, then you will after this, after this presentation finishes. And I'd like to just point out to everyone uh, or remind everyone that um, each of the lectures um, that's presenting over a certain spreadsheet or document uh, will be available for a minimum of one month after he or she gives a presentation to answer your questions as you try and implement these spreadsheets in your own clinic. And so I think that's important that um, we all make use of this. So these are really nice spreadsheets. They're supposed to help organize um, each of your all's departments, um, create a more safe and effective and efficient department, and they're there for your use. And our staff is here to help you use them and to help you um, uh, tweak these uh, spreadsheets to fit your department best. So uh, I think it would be good if, if you all have the time that as you're learning these things and as you're getting these spreadsheets that you take a little time at your clinic and you see how it fits best in your clinic and, and feel free to ask us if, if you're doing things uh, correctly. We'll be happy to help. Okay, yeah. go, go ahead, Sanja. Yeah, actually, I really like your spreadsheets. I took some of the things that you have in there and adapted it into my quarterlies and monthlies because they okay, are very yeah. elegant. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you here, this is in the NCCR commissioning part one. There's a lot of the things that I talked about um, are in here. For example, the, I just showed you at the beginning the interlock check. The... 
sheet label transfer tubes has a lot of the things in here that we talked about. So at delivery, uh, you, you check that everything looks okay. No bends, kinks, physical damage. You check that your source travels through the transfer tubes and into the applicators without any problems, that all connections work correctly. I occasionally in the clinic, I don't know how it happens, but connections get bent and the transfer tubes don't correct connect correctly and the source can't travel through. I have one of these every couple of months or so. Length gauges that come with your delivery, you just compare that they're all um, the same length. This is a specific test for your variant equipment. For those of you who have variant, you see that we'll send out the source to different dwell positions and then you take an image of the tip of the source either by auto radiograph or with a uh, camera and you on a ruler and you verify that it's actually going to the position. Halfway down. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is your timer check. I've talked about that. I usually check only the 120 seconds, but at commissioning, this doesn't take a lot of time. You can check also the linearity at the same time by checking your times set time in the treatment planning system versus your stopwatch and it uh, calculates that you're within your tolerance. Yes, nice description. Applicator length, I think Ben will uh, go over that in the next lecture. Offsets, offsets for the ring. Where was the timer accuracy? Um, Transfer the timer. The transfer time would be on the source source exchange tab all the way at the very beginning. Source exchange. Source, source strength. Source strength here, yeah. yeah. There's a ton of useful tests in here. It's it's amazing. So um, I'm still, where is it? There it is in the bottom left, timer error check. Oh, yeah, here. Timer error check. So here where you check the timer linearity, you, you use the same data also. For each treatment time, you have a reading, and it calculates the slope, the intersection, the correlation, and the overall timer error. So very useful tool here, very elegantly puts everything together. Are there any questions? Anything I should have mentioned, Adam? Uh, Sanja, if you just highlight one of the cells that has a note, it doesn't uh, matter which one. Just what, hover over one that has a note. This one? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, yeah. so you'll see on these spreadsheets. So these spreadsheets are varying gamma med specific, and most of the spreadsheets that you will receive will be varying gamma med specific. But throughout the spreadsheets, you'll see that many of these cells have extensive notes. So if you hover over a cell, you'll see a note that lists details of what's happening in this cell. So it makes it very easy for you to say, see what you have in your system and say, you see exactly what's going on. And then you say, okay, for my system, I have this. So I just need to modify this cell slightly by this manner. Um, Sanjay, if you can go to the transfer tube tab. Yeah. Adam wrote these spreadsheets, so he's most familiar with those. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah so which, click on which the, one? Click on the transfer tube. If you go up to the very top. Very top. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, actually, go down just a little bit to this, the dwell position check. Dwell. Okay, so you'll see here, for example, it may look a little, little bit confusing when you look at it. And this is why I say you have the resources now. We're giving you the spreadsheets. You have instructors that are happy to help you and to, and to second check your work. Um, but you'll see that once you actually look at it, it becomes quite easy. And things are explained in detail in the notes. And this one's set up for 1300, and, and Gamma Med has a particular offset, which is explained in here. And you can edit this slightly to fit your own system. So I think it's, it would be good if, as you start receiving these spreadsheets, to, to work on them and, and have all, all of our experienced educators assist you during that process. It's nice to have all these tools for you initially and just do some minor tweaks to have them set up for your own centers. I think we'll will be very nice for you in the long run. Yeah. 
I'm actually thinking I'm I'm switching from a gamma med to a flexitron in the next nine months. I I could probably share back the modifications I do to these spreadsheets. Ah, um, that would be great. With radiating hope and may, make that a joint effort for, for all of us. Very good, uh, very good. For the different models out there. Yeah. So, Sandra, I'd like to thank you very much for your time this evening. This was a very informative presentation. Um, I think that we all learned a lot. And uh, I'd like to ask one more time if anyone has any questions. Uh, feel free to type it in. And I just want to say, please don't hesitate to email any one of us if you have questions. I do the same sometimes. I email Dan Skanderbeg down in UCSD, a similar equipment. And if I just want to have a second opinion, I, I shoot him an email and say, hey, uh, what do you think? And it's really helpful. And I think we're just, we're a community. We help each other. And, you know, that's what we're here for because we're doing this for our patients and we're all learning. and. Yeah, so we are, we are open to great, communication. That's a great, great point, Sanja. I know I do the same as well. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm constantly emailing friends and asking for advice and that sort of thing. So I think none of us are alone in the fact that we're all in the, the quest for the right answers and to give the best help to our patients. So uh -huh. definitely feel free to email us uh, if you guys have any questions or concerns. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think uh, we don't have any more questions. And thank you again, Sanja. And we will meet again on Wednesday, I think. And Wednesday, we'll be covering applicator commissioning. And I think we're going to have one extra session just specifically on ring commissioning. So the applicators are important and a lot are there for us. So we'll begin that on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day and uh, treat you. safely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.